uh, we are uh, really uh, making history because the history of Jews in China really goes a very, very long way back. And it also is something that, uh, you know, th th there's still a Jewish community there to some extent. Uh, so I'm going to start actually by sharing a lot of personal stories. Why? So a lot of you may not know this, but my grandmother is born in China. But a lot of times people say, oh, were they there because she was with the Jewish refugees who came there in 1940s? Actually, not only was my grandmother born in China, my great-grandmother, and I believe I, I even have great-great-grandparents that uh, are, are born in uh, China. So uh, it's, uh, it's very, very exciting. It's exciting, this opportunity. And I'm going to start sharing some of the stories of how my ancestors ended up in China, because you may ask, what's a good Jewish boy or girl doing in China? And uh, I feel like their stories capture exactly the types of people who ended up in China and how Jews uh, lived in these cities, which often were international trading cities such as Shanghai, Hong Kong. There was a lot of international trade. Uh, so I'll just start uh, sharing that. So my grandmother, Henrietta Distel, was born in Shanghai. She spent there her youth and the years of the war. But actually, her grandfather came to China. His name was Herschel Kammerling. And how did he end up in China? He was, uh, has anyone ever heard of the Cantonists? In the 1800s, the Tsar of Russia would take Jewish children and force them into the Russian army. Now, this was a conscription that you would start at the age of 11 and end at the age of 40 if you stayed alive. And so a lot of Jews would run away. And so he was, he and his family were one of the Jews who ran away first to Istanbul, Turkey. And then when they heard there's business opportunities in uh, in China, they moved to Shanghai. Uh, so that's uh, one, one family member who ended up there, and there were already a lot of Jews living there doing business. Uh, we'll hear later about the Sassoon family, the Kaduri family, Jewish families from Baghdad who ended up living in Hong Kong and in, uh, in Shanghai to, to do business. Uh, so he was there, and actually, while preparing, I'm very thankful, because while preparing this, I actually found historical references to my great-grandfather. What did he do? It's not great. It's great, great. What did he do when he was there? He was a hotel manager. There was a hotel there, sort of like Mandarin Oriental. It was called Astor Place Hotel. And it says there, another valuable employee, this is uh, from their records, another valuable employee was Mr. Kamerling, a Russian Jew born in Turkey who became a reception clerk. With an amazing flair for languages and the opportunity to work with people of many cultures, Mr. Herschel Kammerling eventually learned to converse fluently and faultlessly in German, English, French, Chinese, Hebrew, Japanese, and one or two other languages, as well as his native Russian and Turkish. So it was a very cosmopolitan area, lots and lots of people coming from all over the world. It was an international trade center, and so he did well by speaking this many languages. Uh, and then they say by the 1930s, Kamerling was one of the hotel managers, which we'll see ties into another story later. Uh, then later on, the, uh, the, the Jewish community in Shanghai grew that they started building more synagogues. Uh, and so we'll see also he became the president of the synagogue there. And another historian writes that in 1902, a synagogue committee was formed in Shanghai by Russian Jews. The first chairman was Herschel Kamerling. Uh, and the first Ashkenazi synagogue was inaugurated in 1907. Why is it the first Ashkenazi synagogue? Because the primary uh, uh, community in China at the time was the community of Iraqi Jews, the Sassoons, the Kaduris, who came either from Baghdad or from India, where they also had a lot of business. And so that was also was something that brought people. Interestingly, his wife, uh, my great-great-grandmother, her name was Hanna Rivka, and she was from a Lishansky family. I don't know if any, anyone ever hear of the Neely Underground in Israel, the ones that spied for the British against the Turks. Anyhow, so there was this Neely Underground that was uh, members of her family, Yosef Lishansky, who was famously hung by the Turks for spying for the British. Anyhow, she, was, she ended up leaving then uh, Ottoman Palestine and moving to... Uh, moving to uh, Shanghai. So people ended up there. She was living in, in uh, you know, the early kibbutzim, moshavim, etc. Life uh, got tough for her there. She didn't have children for a while. She heard there's good doctors in Shanghai, and somehow she ended up in Shanghai. Now, here's a very interesting story that has a, a, a touch of romance or lack thereof, whatever you want to call it. But uh, the longest 
membership of my family that's been in, in China uh, was actually there for pure business uh, considerations. Uh, family from Hamburg, Germany, they worked for a uh, international trade company and they were stationed in Shanghai. Why do I tell you this? Because if you decide to raise your family in Shanghai, what do you do when someone arrives at the age where they need to date someone and get married? Arrange there are not... What? You arrange it. You arrange it. But how do you arrange it? You know, this is before the uh, in, age of the internet. What? Nobody was there. Exactly. So what do you do? So the, the, they were the uh, Distal family. So what do they do? They send letters to uh, Hamburg, where they came from, and they arrange a wedding by mail. Can you imagine that? So they arrange a wedding by mail and uh, in Hamburg. And here's what happens. Their son goes to, how do you get to Hamburg? He takes a ship to Seattle, takes a train across the United States of America, takes a ship from New York to Hamburg, takes a wagon to the house, arrives and meets the woman that he's going to marry. Now, if you thought that was terrifying, uh, he gets married with this young girl from the Markovich family who he never met. And then she has to do the whole trip back without knowing anything about China. So uh, as much as it was a culture for him to go and uh, a culture shock for him to go and do all of this, to then get married and, and schlep all the way there. Can you imagine for her to uh, just a few weeks after you're being married to someone you never met, then to travel to New York, to Seattle with a ship to Shanghai, it was uh, requiring a lot of faith. Uh, and so it just gives you an idea of what life was like there. There was really not many people there. Whoever was there for, was there for business. And they relied heavily on outside sources, which also tells you about probably the way things work now, not only in Jewish communities in China, but also gives you an idea there's a sizable Jewish community in the Philippines, uh, in Singapore. There's, there's other Jewish communities, and it gives you an idea of what it's like to have a Jewish community in the Far East. Think about all the things we take for granted, kosher food, uh, a shofar, a megillah, a Torah scroll, all these things, you have to rely on international shipping and letters, and it's it's a whole to-do. Uh, yeah? I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah, China during the war, war was a, a different story, but I'll, I'll give you a, another idea. I'll, 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 I don't, I'll get there. Uh, but my great-grandfather, interestingly, who was born in Shanghai to a German Jewish family, very assimilated, uh, he went back to get his education in Berlin. So even though they lived in Shanghai, their environment was German, and he went to the University of Berlin. And this is a really, really profound story because it has a lot of implications. He goes, and in 1929, while he's in Berlin, Hans Diesel listens on the radio to a speech by a, a, a charismatic politician who's a bit on the fringes, Adolf Hitler. Mm. And he hears it, and uh, this is very profound. He hears this speech by Hitler, and he says, I'm not sticking around for this. In 1929, he packs up his suitcases and he goes to Shanghai. What does this teach you? Uh, it teaches you how little anti-Semitism they had in China. With all the troubles that there are with China today, today and that there were back then, anti-Semitism is not one of them. They did not know what anti-Semitism is. China, India had very, very little, if any, anti-Semitism. And so when he endured this in Germany, he's like, I'm not staying there. German Jews might have been like, okay, this is the normal. But uh, anti-Semitism in general in the Far East, Japan, India... Uh, uh, China is not a uh, not a common thing. Uh, so I, I think uh, as much as that's a specific story, I think it carries lessons for today in terms of how sometimes we're desensitized to anti-Semitism and need to realize how uh, abnormal it is. But eventually the family uh, had to move also out of China. We'll see that. The revolution in 1949, the communist revolution, really had people fleeing. But where did it all begin? Where did the history of Jews in China all begin. So there's all these ancient traditions. Some people say that there were Jews coming there right after the destruction of the Second Temple. And there's actually an account of a fellow who lived in the ninth century named Eldad Hadani. Eldad Hadani was a guy who had 
great travel experience, but also a great imagination. So it's hard to know which of his stories are which. He would travel the world and document Jewish life from Ethiopia to India, all kinds of places. But a lot of times he, uh, he made stuff up. At the same time, also, his, a lot of his focus was a focus on the 10 lost tribes. And we'll see that the people, the Jews in China, when they lived there, they were not referred to as Jews. They were referred to by the locals as, uh, uh, I can't even pronounce it properly, but uh, basically Israel without the R. Right, so they, they referred to it as the people of Israel. So this El Dada Dani in the ninth century believed that the ten lost tribes uh, that were lost in the time of the first temple ended up settling in all kinds of places. One of which is uh, is China. Uh, so in terms of his halachic rulings and Jewish law, we don't rely on him. But in terms of uh, in terms of just the, the the fact that he acknowledges that there are Jews in China, that's an important thing. Uh, the very interesting piece of literature. Does, is everyone familiar with the idea of the ten lost tribes? Basically, during the first temple, uh, you, why are we called Jews? Because we come from the tribe of Judea. But what happened to the tribe of Reuven, Shimon, uh, uh, Yisachar, Zevulun, Dan, Gad, Asher, Naphtali? Uh, where are they? And so it, during the time of the first temple, they were expelled by the king of Assyria. And ever since then, there's been great fascination in rabbinic literature as to where they, where they are. There's a debate in the Mishnah if when the Messiah comes, he is going to bring back also these 10 lost tribes, or maybe he's just going to bring back the people of Judea. There's a fascination with it. There's a debate between Rabbi Akiva and another rabbi. Will they ever return? And so writing in his commentary in the 1800s, in the 1700s and 1800s, there's a commentary called Tiferet Israel by Rabbi Israel Lipschitz from Germany. He writes, that which Rashi has noted, that some of the ten lost tribes were returned by the prophet Jeremiah, is hard to accept, as we now know that the lands of uh, Chalach and Chavor, which are mentioned in the Bible as places that the ten tribes have been exiled to, in the lands of India are all known to us, and we know that the Jews in India and China are a small fraction of the number of Jews living in Africa, Europe, and Asia. So it's fascinating. He acknowledges that there are Jews living in China, he just says they cannot be of the 10 lost tribes because if they would be, they would outnumber us. And we know that they're a very small number. So he acknowledges there are Jews in China. He acknowledges that they're a small number. And he acknowledges that it's unlikely that those Jews come from the 10 lost tribes because otherwise they would outnumber uh, the rest of the Jews. Uh, and so he goes on. He speaks about the Jews of China, Ethiopia, and he says that it's about them that Rabbi Akiva and Rabbi Elezer disagree as to whether they'll be redeemed in the Messianic era. Uh, and even though some of them are idol worshippers and their very Judaism has been forgotten from them, uh, nonetheless, the belief is that they'll be returned. So you have a mixture of the uh, history and the, I guess, uh, theology of it. Will they come back? Are they all there or only some of them there? Who are the Jews that are in China? Are they Israel? or are they from Judea? So it's just interesting to note in how many early sources uh, it's mentioned that there are Jews in China. Now, from a more academic perspective, if you take a look, uh, is anyone here familiar with the Silk Road? Who knows about the Silk Road? Yeah. All right, good. So I'll, I'll give a, a quick, basically the Silk Road is a trading route uh, that connected the Far East back to the Middle East and, and Europe. Marco Polo, does that name sound familiar? All those, yeah. basically, uh, uh, the, connecting uh, for trade with the Far East. Now, this Silk Road goes through Persia, uh, right above India, all the way to China. So which kind of Jews do you think arrived in China first? Persians. Exactly, Persians and Persian Jews. I'd say merchants. Oh, merchants. Sorry, I thought you said Persians. Uh, but both, it's true. Uh, uh, Persians and merchants, say, uh, same meaning it was Persian Jews who were merchants. And they arrived in China, and there's actually in the British Museum a manuscript written in Judeo-Persian. You know how we speak Yiddish, and it's, uh, and it's uh, basically you use Hebrew letters to write something that's a German dialect? So there was also Judeo-Arabic, and there's Ladino for Spanish, but there was also Judeo-Persian. 
And so there's a letter dating back to the 700s found in China that's written in Judeo-Persian. So there is evidence of Jewish life in China as early as the 700s. And we'll see that throughout the dominant group of Jews coming to China are Jews coming from Persia. Uh, spoiler alert, if you found two scriptures in China, what would they be? Well, it, Jewish scriptures, two Jewish books, what would you guess? Is it the book of uh, uh, Judges, of Yehoshua? What do you think the two books are? It's the Chumash and the book of Esther. Why? Because the book of Esther is very much also the story of Persian Jews. Uh, and so Megillat Esther, yes. Uh, so th th what they had was the, the basically the five books of Moses and the book of Esther. The people who are coming to China are Jews who are Persian. And they encounter really no anti-Semitism. I, I cannot emphasize this enough, that really China is a place that basically has no anti-Semitism. And it has major, major uh, consequences. And uh, we'll see how that probably has an impact to this day. But eventually, the, the real official time that the Jews arrive in China is in the, in the 900s. Uh, there's something called the Song Dynasty, and that king, that emperor, invites Jews to live there, and he gives them free rights, and he gives them also a uh, license to work in the civil service, which is not to be taken for granted. Jews didn't have this in Europe. Uh, if you were a European Jew, you couldn't always work as a doctor, as a lawyer, things like that. But in China, you could. And uh, so he invites the Jews. And the capital of the Song Dynasty is the city of Keifeng. Has anyone ever heard of the city of Keifeng? So the Jews of, of Keifeng are the oldest group of Jews uh, that lived in China. And these are Jews that uh, be become Chinese. He gives them the right to have Chinese last names. He allocates. You know how we have... Uh, Goldberg, and uh, what, are, what are the, the basic uh, Ashkenazi names that you have? Uh, Greenberg, Levine, things like that. So basically, the Jews were allotted a few names. So in China, the same thing. So if you're not a Levine or a Schwartz, uh, in China, there were eight names, Ai, Shai, Gao, Jing, Lai, uh, Li, Zhang, and Zhao. These are eight names that are given to Jews that they can have as, uh, as, their, as their last names. It's interesting, the Jews there have a pretty vibrant uh, community, but they do something that will bring them apart from the Jewish people for eternity. What is it that they do that brings them apart from etern uh, for eternity? Uh, because they, as they assimilated and enjoyed life in China, they were disconnected from the larger Jewish community. They didn't have the kind of relationship. Now we have uh, cousins in Israel, friends in England. They did not have that. They lived in a bubble. And so there was no exchange. You couldn't get a shofar and you couldn't get a matzah from another country, etc. And they started assimilating and they switched. Who, how do you decide who's a Jew today? You follow matrilineal. Uh, you go by the mom matrilineal descent. They changed that, and that changed everything. They had they changed it over where if you marry, as long as the father was Jewish, uh, they decided the kids were Jewish. So the men married Chinese women, and in many cases they would have a Jewish wife and then another two or three uh, Chinese women, and that breaks them from the rest of the Jewish people because Jewish tradition has been following the mother. And so the second you have generations that are not following this tradition of, uh, of uh, other Jews, you have a break where according to most Jews in the world, they are not halachically, technically Jewish, but in their minds, they are 100% Jewish. Uh, so that I would say is the biggest uh, break. That's the biggest break where they sort of uh, didn't leave the Jewish people, but changing that... Uh, changing that practice, changing that, uh, changing that aspect of Jewish life and practice. You know, if you change what's kosher, what's not kosher, it's terrible, but it doesn't cut off the Jewish continuity aspect in terms of the way the world, Jews in the world do it. If you decide that uh, it somewhat doesn't ma matter who the mom is, that kind of uh, is, is hard to uh, overcome. But you'd be surprised, they still have a very, very devout Jewish community. They read the Torah, they build a synagogue, and they have scriptures, they have a rabbi. It's similar to Spanish and Portuguese Jewry. 
in the sense that the rabbi, the rabbi's biggest qualification is being able to read Hebrew or being a chazan. That's what they needed the rabbi for because they they didn't uh, they didn't they didn't have that. So they have a rabbi and uh, they build a synagogue. And this synagogue actually existed until very late on. Yeah. Yes, good point. They did circumcise their children. Uh, they did a lot. They, they did a few things. They did not eat pork under any circumstances. They circumcised their children. They tried to keep the Jewish holidays. And in many cases, they've been confused. Uh, and I see we're, we're getting some questions here also online uh, that, uh, yeah, they, they, they didn't convert their wives, but they did have... Um, or in some cases they probably did, but you know it, it, it wasn't something that would be halachically valid. Uh, they uh, they circumcised their children. They read the Torah. They went to synagogue. Uh, so in that sense, they were very very devout. Uh, and we're going to see there are sometimes that there were other conflicts between halacha, Jewish law, and life in China. And we'll see how they overcome that. But 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 really. They, they were, in a sense, confused a lot with Muslims because the only people in China at the time that didn't follow uh, Chinese culture or religion were Muslims. In fact, they were known by two names, very interestingly. Uh, one is they were known as the Muslims with blue hats. There were Muslims, other, I guess Chinese didn't cover their hair and Jews, Jewish men did have something on their head and so did Muslims. So they were known as the Muslims with the blue hats. The other thing is very interesting. They were known as the people who remove the sinew. What does that mean? Does everyone know the mitzvah of Gid Hanashe, removing the sciatic nerve? The story with Jacob, Jacob gets struck in his um, thigh with, with the angel of Esau. We just read it. And so it says that therefore the children of Esau, for animal to be kosher today, you have to remove a certain part of the thigh of the cow. So the Jews were known, I don't know why of all the commandments this one was chosen, it seems pretty random, but Jews were known as the people who removed the uh, sciatic nerve, who removed the, the sinew. Uh, so that's what something that, that, that they did do. But despite keeping all these things and, and being devoted to mitzvot, again, you have the matrilineal, matrilineal patrilineal issue that became so much of an issue at, to the extent that Israel, even years later, could not accept Kaifang Jews, who in, in a way are one of the oldest Jewish communities in the world, but at the same time, Israel couldn't accept it because they didn't follow the Jewish definition of halacha. Uh, the, the Chinese government followed its Soviet neighbor's advice to not recognize Judaism as one of the 50 uh, religions and ethnicities that they recognize. And basically that came from the tradition of Chinese Jews who treated Judaism less as an ethnicity and more of a uh, religion. And so it's a religion and anyone can really join pretty e easily. Yeah? Did they put mezuzahs? Not that I know of. No, we're going to see what they do. did, but um, it, it, it's interesting. Uh, in terms of, I'm getting a lot of questions online, uh, and... Uh, it's great comments here that uh, really uh, people did, they did have certain customs that there's actually, interestingly, when this, I don't want to give away what's happening later, but when the synagogue was destroyed, there was a well at the bottom of the synagogue. I don't know if it was a well that was used for a mikvah or if it was a well that was used for, uh, you know, just water, but uh, the well remains and in a pretty cruel way, the Chinese government about seven years ago uh, came to what's the only remnant of this synagogue that's six, seven hundred years old, and they sealed it, uh, which is pretty mean. Uh, and, and, but yeah, the, 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 they did have a well, maybe they had a mikvah. I don't know exactly which mitzvahs they, uh, they, they did. I'm sure that early on they had a lot of mitzvot that they did. Uh, here's an interesting issue. What halachic issues, what issues of conflict between Jewish law and Chinese culture might you find uh, between Judaism and uh, Chinese culture? So one thing, does everyone know what te kow tao is? So bowing down is very, very common in Chinese culture, but not just like, you know, you see in judo and karate matches, you'll, you'll have uh, people really fully bowing down. 
so one issue was the bowing down. Uh, and so the, the, the Jews, you know, did accept this form of politeness where you sort of see someone and you bow down to them. Uh, but then there was another issue, which is there, one of the emperors, interestingly, had people put his name on a silver plate and he asked everyone to bow down to that silver plate. Sort of like the story of Haman. Yeah, so he asks everyone to bow down to his name. So what did, what do Jews do? Now, it's one thing to resist Haman, but when you're, I guess, 300 people in China, it's harder to resist. Uh, what they did is they would have this plate with the emperor's name, but they wrote on the top, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, and they would bow down to the, uh, they would bow down to this plate that had Hashem's name, but I guess uh, the emperor's name as well. Another thing that was customary there in China, respecting your parents is a, is a very big deal, which is great, but there's also a thing of bowing down to parents. So things like that, the Jews did accept. So from early on, they would uh, do things like bowing down to your parents and, and uh, following those uh, traditions. But this was a secret. We did not know about this. The rest of the Jewish world had no idea that Jews existed in China. Not only that, the Gentile world did not know that Jews existed in China. So uh, what happens? When does this change? So in the year 1601, uh, there's a fellow named Matteo Ricci, and he's a Jesuit who is sent by the Pope to see what the situation is in China. What kind of population is there? What's going on there? And he goes to China in the year 1605. And while he's in Shanghai, he meets a Jew who's there to take his civil service exams. By the way, it's important to note, Chinese culture for hundreds and maybe thousands of years was far, far superior and advanced to Europe, definitely Europe of the Dark Ages. They had a civil service, they had you know people going for degrees and education and everything. So this guy comes to Shanghai, this Jesuit from Rome, and he sees a Jew, he meets a Jew, and he, he didn't know that there are Jews living there. And the Jew didn't know who this guy is. He's told that the way they meet, the, 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 the guy's name is uh, Etienne. Uh, and he meets Matteo Ricci, who's from Rome. And he says to him, who are you? And Ricci realizes that this guy's Jewish. And they're both very excited. Believe it or not, the Jewish community offers this Jesuit. They didn't know exactly what Christians are. They offer him to be their rabbi. Why? Because he knows scripture. And so they tell him on two conditions. What two conditions should there be for the guy to be their rabbi? They tell him on the condition that you circumcise yourself and that you stop eating pork. But he resists this tempting offer to become the rabbi of the Jews in Kaifeng. And, uh, and he passes on it. But interestingly, he sends word back to Rome, to the Pope, and they're very excited. Why are they very excited? This is also humorous. Uh, they're excited. Why would the Pope be excited that there are Jews in China? Well, yes, they do send Jesuit uh, uh, folks to uh, uh, convert them, but they believe that the Torah scroll, that th they believe there's some conspiracy and that the rest of the Jews, the pesky Jews that they know in Poland and Italy, crossed Jesus' name out of the Bible where he must have been there from the very beginning. So he says... We have to go look at their Torah scrolls because there must be a mentioning of Jesus from the very beginning. Uh, spoiler alert, there wasn't. But uh, that was one of the reasons the Pope was excited to, uh, to, to see these uh, Jews because he said, uh, you know, l let's see if they have any mentioning of Jesus, but they didn't. Uh, so these, the, 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 it's interesting. The Kaifeng Jews became closer with the Jesuits than they did with the Jewish world because this is the first uh, the first outside contact that they had, uh, and so they were very, very excited. Now, at the same time, uh, the Kaifeng Jewish community sees a major, major, major decline, and eventually in the early 1800s, uh, you have what's called the, the fall, I would say, of the Kaifeng Jews. In 1860, there's something called the Yellow River. It floods, and the synagogue is destroyed. Uh, about 15, 20 years later, the rabbi dies, and that is the end of Kaifeng Jews as we know it. St today, they're still a very small group, but that's pretty much the end. And I just want to emphasize this so much. Why? Because even though they had Torah scrolls and they had 
uh, there's actually like a big large steel that they have with the um, uh, inscriptions of, of their history. The second they lost the ability to read Hebrew, the second they lost their synagogue, their rabbi, their communication with the world, that was pretty much the end of the community. And I know for me, that's a shocker. Why? Because sometimes I say, I say this on the high holidays, you know, maybe if you want to say a prayer in English, say a prayer, we underestimate the value of Hebrew. The second they didn't have a community that where someone, at least one person knew Hebrew, that was pretty much the end. The second they didn't have a synagogue, that was the end. They, they survived for many hundreds of years. But the inability to have one person that reads Hebrew, that reads the Torah, that sealed their fate. And to me, that's, that's something fascinating. So as much as we can learn from Chinese Jews about the uh, ability to persevere and survive, we also learn uh, uh, the importance of the lack of uh, uh, literature, education, Hebrew, connection to Jewish communities, synagogue, the community is, uh, its fate is sealed. And I think that's, to me, a very, very powerful lesson uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of Jewish life today. And we're lucky that we live in a world where even Jews who live in, say, uh, Singapore and, and Hong Kong and far places, they, they have with the internet uh, and other things, they have uh, the ability to come and, and uh, be in touch. I just want to, uh, there's so much to cover. I hope I get to everything. But I just want to read to you a, a, a letter that's so beautiful. As the Kaifeng Jewish community is declining, they sell their Torah scrolls which is against Jewish law. You're not allowed to sell Torah scroll unless it's for two dire reasons. And they sell them and to Christians and others. And those end up in Shanghai, where now you have the Sassoon family and families from Baghdad building up the Jewish community. And the Jews of Shanghai suddenly see the markets. You know, I'm not talking about stock markets. I'm talking about flea markets, whatever it may be. They see Torah scrolls in Hebrew. And they realize that the Jews of Kefung are selling their Torah scrolls, by the way, one of which is in Toronto. Uh, they're selling them on the market for some money. Uh, and so they write to them a letter that I think is heartwarming because it teaches you what caring for another community is. And they write to them, our brethren, we heard that your synagogue has been destroyed and that you have no rabbi or teacher to teach you the Torah of God and the right way in the service of God. And now you have forgotten everything to the extent that you sold your Torah scroll that remained with you. And recently we have seen here in our city, Shanghai, among the people who are not Jewish, Torah scrolls that were bought from you three, four months ago, and we heard you. Now, sometimes we reprimand people, right? So the Jews of Shanghai are obviously mad that the Kaifeng Jews are selling their Torah scrolls. But instead of reprimanding them, they say, our heart is broken and filled with anguish as we heard this bad rumor. You have forgotten the word of God. Your, uh, your fathers uh, taught you and Shabbat and holidays, and you have abandoned circumcision. Therefore, we've been awakened to help you, and we have sought to send messengers from our people to see what this is all about. We yearn to help you, and they offer to send them financial help. They offer to send them uh, teachers, whatever it may take, money to help them. I think it's just a beautiful lesson about when you see a Jewish community struggling, sometimes it's easy to reprimand. It's harder to put your money where your mouth is and to say, look, if you need anything, if you need uh, help with anything we can do, uh, we are here to help you. Uh, so I think that's a very, very powerful lesson. But I think uh, what a lot of people want to ask is about what happened during the Holocaust. So as we are speaking, the, the, the Kaifeng Jewish community is really reaching its decline. But at the same time, between the British uh, opening the Hong Kong colony and between in the North Harbin, uh, the Russians build a big uh, railway center there. Thousands and thousands of Jews start moving to China. And that includes my family. Interestingly, Harbin, which is northern China, uh, a lot of Russian Jews came there. My grandmother went to teach English in the area in the 1990s. She goes there to the bakery. This is in the 1990s. And she sees in the bakery a braided bread. It's challah. And she goes over to the baker and she says, what is this? And the baker says, I don't know what it is, but we have a tradition that every Friday we make the bread this way. So a lot of the Jews that were there sort of in a transient way uh, ended up really leaving a very big imp impact. Uh, so what happened during uh, the, the years where you, you saw the most Jews? Uh, basically, the number of Jews continues to increase. 
And again, there's already not only Iraqi Jews, but also Ashkenazi Jews, Russian Jews in Harbin, you have Jews in Hong Kong, Jews in Shanghai. Uh, the Nazis take over Austria and Germany, and lots and lots of Jews flee to Shanghai. It's important to note, who was in control of Shanghai at the time? Was it the Chinese? No, it was uh, the Japanese. The Japanese took over in 1937. So a lot of times the Chinese government says, oh, uh, you know, we saved the Jews during the Holocaust. I'm not here to, to diss them or anything. But actually the Japanese controlled Shanghai. And so they took in tens of thousands, more than most other countries combined. Uh, they took in tens of thousands of Jews as refugees. 400 doctors come to, uh, which was great for them, and uh, 400 doctors, 20,000 Jews come uh, just from uh, Austria, Germany, and they settle down there. Who supports all these people? 20, there were 5,000 Jews living there. Suddenly you have 20,000 Jews with no jobs. All right, so there you go. But who, who's, who supported 20,000 Jews who arrived there? So it's interesting. The joint, the JDC from New York, sent the money. But in 1941, once you have Pearl Harbor... Uh, then there's a boycott. You can't send a single dollar to Japan. And so suddenly all of these people are stuck. That's when really the, the families of Sassoon, Kaduri, uh, and, and other wealthy Jewish families in the Far East really step in. And, and also there's other American Jewish organizations that tried to uh, bypass the American laws to support the poor uh, Jews that were there. Yeah? Mm -hmm. He said that once Japan came into China, the, the soldiers started breaking the wooden shoes. Terror, but, but that wasn't a Jewish, a uniquely Jewish situation. But you're right. The Japanese soldiers ravaged, ravaged China in a horrible. My grandmother lived there at the time, and you know it, it was enough. It, 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 you can shiver if you hear of the stories of what the Japanese soldiers did. Oh, horrific acts of barbarism. Now. Interesting to note, though, as much as we can uh, criticize them, the, the Japanese, for what they did, uh, they were pressured by their ally. Who's their ally? Yeah, Hitler. At this, they are pressured to throughout the war to apply the final solution and to mass kill all the Jews. There's a famous story. Uh, the Japanese governor of Shanghai calls in the Jewish rabbis, and he asks him, because he, there's really, the Far East is pretty much free of anti-Semitism. He asks him, what's the story with these people? Why are they wanting to kill you all the time? The rabbi was very wise, and he looks at him and he says, you know why they want to kill us? Because we're Oriental. Because we're from the Middle East, we're from the East, and that's why the Germans want to kill us. And I, that resonated. And the Japanese, A, did not kill the Jews there, and also they, a lot of, they, they let more refugees come. Another interesting thing is they put all the Jewish refugees into a ghetto in 1941. Now, my family, because they were not refugees, because they were there from earlier, they lived outside of the ghetto. And they lived in a German area, which was very unpleasant because they were mixed with the Germans throughout the war, but they were Jews. And so they used that. Sometimes my great-grandmother would smuggle uh, food. They had to smuggle food to the ghetto. Uh, there, there were really those were very, very tough years. My grandmother didn't speak so much about them, but those were really horrible years. But you have to note that the uh, the, the Japanese did not cave in in terms of mass uh, killings of Jews. They didn't do that. Uh, another interesting and famous story is the story of uh, Miri Yeshiva from Poland. Uh, Sugihara, we honored him in the synagogue a few times. Uh, a Japanese diplomat to Lithuania issued visas. He couldn't give citizenship to foreigners, so he issued visas to Jews in Lithuania, uh, tra transit visas to Karachi, and then they went to Kobe in Japan, and then they, they were sent out of Japan, and they ended up in Shanghai. But uh, thousands, of, tens of thousands of people were saved because of this guy Sugihara, who on his own initiative ended up uh, giving visas and letting Jews... Uh, letting Jews in, into, uh, into China. Uh, there's a few very interesting folks I want to talk about. There's a guy named Two Gun Cohen, uh, a family friend. I would go to my grandmother's house. She said, this gift is from Two Gun Cohen. 
Uh, this is a guy. I'll give you a brief uh, history of the man, and you'll see how you get the name. It's not a cha- Chinese name. It's literally spelled out, Tu Gun Kohen. And uh, he was a macher, as they would say in Yiddish. He was born in Poland. The family moved to England. He was a troublemaker all his childhood. His father sent him to a tiny farm near Saskatchewan in Canada. And uh, one day when he was in this town in Canada, uh, there was uh, someone who was beating up on a Chinese person. And because he was involved with boxing and gambling and God knows what, he, he was strong enough and he beat the guy up. And since then, he became a hero among the local Chinese community. And uh, th- th- there was this new leader in China called uh, Su- uh, Dr. Sun Yat-sen, and he was advocating for building, uh, you know, the, a, a united Republic of China. And so this guy, Tu Gun Cohen, also started hanging around with him. Eventually, he goes to China. He becomes his personal security detail. Nobody knows exactly how important he was because he always would exaggerate himself. You never know if he's just a security guard or a general, but he used to say he's a general. Uh, but he actually helped sort of the, the founding fathers of China and uh, is very, very respected. One day when he was protecting the Chinese uh, uh, leader, Sun Yat-sen, he, he was shot with a bullet that scrapped his hand. And he said, wait, what if my right hand goes? What do I do then? So that's when he started training his second hand to shoot a gun. And he would always walk around with two guns, hence the name Two Gun Cohen. Um, how did he know my family? Well, I just discovered recently because uh, it said that he hung around a lot, the Astor Place Hotel, the hotels in Shanghai. And if you heard early on, my great, great, great grandfather, uh, Herschel Kammerling, was the manager of the hotel. So between two Jews in Shanghai, uh, you, should know, you should know one another. But uh, there are other Jewish people who became really founding fathers of, of uh, the Republic of China. Now, it's interesting with this Tu Gun Kohen, he seems like a fringe guy, but the Chinese, when they were establishing their country, they had him come with them to lobby uh, the British Empire in London and America in Washington. And he was, he told, you know, he was a very flary guy. It's like, sure, no problem. You need to meet the president, Congress, I'll do it. And, uh, and uh, but he actually told London and, and DC to listen to these people. And who knows how history would look even today with all the tensions we have in China, if London and Washington would listen to him and say, look, uh, we need to build relationships with this guy, these guys. Instead, they dismissed them. So they went to a bit north to Stalin, which we're still suffering from to this day. Uh, but there were other Jewish doctors who, uh, who helped establish the Chinese uh, uh, health service. And, and there's really, really a lot to say. Uh, I would say that the biggest lessons that we can learn from the history of Jews in China uh, which, which again goes back 13, 1400 years. First of all, the importance of connection to the rest of the Jewish world. You can survive 100 years, 200 years, but you need to be able to connect with other Jews, whether it's for ritual purposes, educational purposes, you need to have contacts with Jews in other communities. The other thing I would say is the fact that you have anti Semitism or don't have anti Semitism does not spell the fate of a Jewish community. India. China, Japan are basically anti-Semitism free zones. And at the same time, you see how Jews did not thrive there the way that, you know, sometimes we, we rightfully do it. We say, oi, gewalt, uh, there's anti-Semitism. But it doesn't mean that if we lived in societies that had no anti-Semitism, we would thrive. It doesn't, anti-Semitism doesn't spell the fate of the Jewish people necessarily. In fact, in the case of the Far East, sometimes you see that uh, where there was no anti-Semitism, Jewish communities did not uh, did not succeed and did not thrive. I see there's a lot of questions. If, if anyone has questions here, please. Uh, um, uh, uh, but but I, I'm getting comments from people who really are family members and people who knew I said we might have someone here from Hong Kong. Uh, so the Iraqi Jewish families are the ones who helped out Financially, which is what I heard from my grandmother during the war when the joint couldn't send money anymore. The Iraqi families really uh, helped fund the Jewish community. Yeah, I I know my grandmother has, but uh, the the oh wow, we have someone who's been to Kaifeng. Uh, it, it, there are still people who see themselves as Kaifeng Jews. I have not been. Unfortunately, we left China under bad terms uh, in 1949 when the communists took over. They really made life brutal. Some, in fact, uh, the, I'll tell you something interesting. There's a guy, Dr. Jacob Rosenfeld, who fled Vienna, helped build a, a lot of the health systems in, in China, saved thousands of lives, uh, and he, he fled Austria. 
But uh, once the revolution came, he left to visit family in Israel. They told him he can't come back in. Then, after many years in the recent past, they built a statue honoring him. What did they say at the building of the statue? Jacob Rosenfeld, a testimony to the friendship, to the, to the, the, the Sino-Austrian friendship. Now, both Austria and China were countries that betrayed him because China didn't let him back in and Austria had the Nazis. Uh, so sometimes the statelessness of Jews uh, impacted them that way. But the, the Chinese consulate sends people to his grave in Israel every year. There's another guy, Richard Frey, who became a member of this central communist party. But he built, helped build the NIH of China. The, the, there's Jews who really uh, did a great deal for modern day China or, 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 or China as we know it. Yeah? Are there Jewish communities in China now? And how does the communist government view Judaism and the practice of Judaism? So good question. So in the case of Kaifeng and other uh, Jewish communities, they took advice from Stalin. And what Stalin did is basically he said, here's a list of the recognized uh, religions and ethnicities. And we're not on, we didn't make the list. Uh, so they have a list of all kinds of ethnicities and religions. We're not on there. Uh, so they don't recognize it. And even if they did, they have a law, which seems, by the way, designed by someone who hates to go to Minion. Uh, they, they have a law that if you're having a religious gathering, only up to 10 people. Uh, you can't have, I, I don't know if you can have a 10th or not, but basically forget about having a Minion. Uh, so to have Jewish life, we need to come together and they allow for it individually. So A, they don't recognize us, us as an ethnicity and B, or religion, B, they don't let for gatherings. However, there is Chabad in Beijing, as you know, uh, 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 the, the, there's a well-known Chabad there. So but uh, yes, um, but uh, the issue is there, it often depends, it's, it's, it's catering to visitors, meaning it's not catering for a local they Jewish community. Very, I'm sorry, they have a very strong expat community because two Jewish girls from Long Island built a hospital in Beijing. In Beijing. And there's... Uh, my father went to that hospital. Every okay, year for so Chicago. in the in the past seven years, uh, in general, well, even in the past year, uh, freedom in China has been very much restricted, and so it, it, it's hard. You know, these things change minute to minute, uh, and uh, so I would say that ten years ago, it was it was looking very good. There's a Jewish community in Hong Kong because Hong Kong was, there's about 5,000 Jews living in Hong Kong. There's a Jewish day school, K through 8. There's my great grandparents, by the way, uh, just another added fact my great grandparents ended up going back to Hong Kong where they spent the rest of their lives and they went to the Ohelea synagogue, which is there. And uh, they have a great rabbi and it's, it's, they have a school. They have, my, my great grandmother in China was known as the chicken lady because she ordered kosher chickens, I think from Australia, you needed to get it at the time. She helped build the mikveh there, but it's hard. It's like, you know, it, it, even during COVID in Hong Kong, there, there were babies who were born and you couldn't have a bris. And like after a year when they let in the mohel, I, there's a great picture. They had a bris for like, you know, 10 babies at a time once you get them oil. So it, it, it's, it, the, the distance does make a difference. Um, so yes, um, I see another person writing in here. There are people here who may be writing from China as we speak. There's a vibrant uh, Jewish life for expats in the mainland, Shanghai, Beijing, uh, for Israelis in Chengdu, and several communities, Sephardi, Modern Orthodox, Chabad, uh, in Hong Kong. So uh, I am happy we have uh, some experts here who may be even reporting uh, from huge, huge. So, and, and and that goes back to the Sassoon family the Kaduri family a lot of Jews from Iraq ended up moving to uh, Hong Kong so they were the the sort of dominant community and before they were Kabat throughout China they all would come into Hong Kong Hong Kong was the place Shabbat yeah and stay at the, my great grandparents sometimes a lot a lot of people I don't know if anyone heard of uh, Mitchell Silk he's, uh, he's he was the deputy secretary of treasury he also uh, there's a lot of people that uh, you end up if you live in uh, if you live in Hong Kong, uh, it, it's a very international city. A lot of people come and go for business. Shanghai also, but not as much as uh, Hong Kong. So yes, there's a lot a lot to be learned. There's a lot going on there and uh, a lot of trade uh, going forward. Who knows? God knows. But uh, it's important to note that again, the fact that you're a country that's free of anti-Semitism is not always a recipe for thriving Jewish life and vice versa. But uh, it, 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 is, it is a beautiful thing to, 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 
you know, the Israeli prime minister said once in a meeting, I think uh, he, he, he said that uh, we have good relationships with India and China. So between the three of our people, we make up half the world. Uh, but uh, if you look at our sizes, uh, our sizes are very, very, very different. I once uh, had a guest from uh, India over on Shabbat, wasn't Jewish. And I said, what percent of the world do you think is Jewish? He said, it must be uh, 20%. And he, he, he was in a state of disbelief when I said it for 14 million. So the, 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 the similarities between our cultures are that ancient, we're very ancient cultures. There's a lot of respect to elders and parents, but the size is a bit different. Uh, they're, 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 they outdo us just a bit uh, in, in the, si in the you know, size. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you for, for participating. And... Uh, I want to help build the museum thing in the